grace upon all, that you provide the rain, the sunshine for all, and that salvation is simple as just believing in Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray that your words today will, will pierce our hearts, Father, and that we'll, we'll want to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. We, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you look in Romans 12, that's where we're going to start. And coincidentally, and I'm saying that sarcastically, guess where we're at tonight in Romans? Romans 12. And I think that I'm running behind in Romans and everything, and then I start preparing sermon. Like, that's exactly where we are again. God just has it all figured out. I don't. I just have to be obedient and follow along. But that is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And in this chapter, you'll see that Paul is talking to the individual Christian, and then he is talking to Christians as a body, as a church. So I kind of call this Christian Living 101 is what Romans chapter 12 is, the basics of Christianity. And it starts out with therefore, so we have to figure out what is he talking about. Basically, he's talking about the theology that he set up in the first 11 chapters. And we see that, that salvation comes by grace, that we're all doomed. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But because God is merciful and loving and kind, He offers salvation to anyone who will believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we finish up in chapter 11, we see that Paul's longing for Israel because they have rejected the Messiah. They're the ones that actually crucified Him. And he says that I would give up my salvation if I could. He longs for them, but he is called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And because of their disbelief, we get the gospel message. It's all part of God's plan. Who would figure it? But God is just amazing and true and brings about, even in times of rebellion and shame, victory. Victory through Jesus. So we start out in Romans 12, Therefore... Brothers, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So I urge you, or I plead with you, I beg you. Brothers and sisters, that means those who know Jesus Christ, who are saved, who have been bought by the power of the blood of Jesus, those who are children of God, belong to His family, in view of God's mercy. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what mercy is, right? Simple definition is mercy is getting the exact opposite of what we deserve. And we'll get a little bit further into it. But I deserve, the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. I sinned against God Almighty. I deserve whatever punishment that He wants to dish out. And in our case, it's eternal separation from God because He cannot tolerate sin. He can't have sin in His presence. Thank goodness, because I know when I have a home in heaven, when I go there, that it's going to be perfect in every way. I know that we don't have to worry about pain and suffering anymore. That we don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about sin in our lives, because we'll be past all that. The Old Testament defines mercy in three different, with three different words, though. And I'll try to pronounce these right. You didn't have much to pronounce today, did you? But I do. I've got several. So the first one is racham. You don't know if it's right or not, but I did it anyway. It means compassion, tender love. It's mercy from the bowels, the love that a mother has for her child that is built in there. That's an attribute of God in His mercy. He loves us from deep within inside. He gives us mercy when we don't deserve mercy. And see, we go back to our scripture that we read this morning when it says to love our enemies, to be kind to them. Because God provides for each and every one. When we have the rain, when we have the oxygen, when we have the sunshine, it's not because we've done anything right. It's because of God's mercy to provide for us. Can you imagine how nice it was, how perfect it was in the Garden of Eden? And see, when we go to heaven, it's all going to be restored and made perfect again. And we won't ever have to worry about being separated from the love of God that is through Christ Jesus our Lord. The second word used in the Old Testament is kased. It's a loving kindness, a favor. It's the most common use of the word mercy. It's mercy with no reason whatsoever except I choose to be merciful. The attribute of God. He cho chose to offer mercy. When His Son was being scorned and shamed and beaten and ridiculed and then nailed upon a tree, He still decided to offer mercy. The most darkest time in this world, 
and He still chose to give mercy because that's who He is. He is merciful. And that is what the Christian is called to be. In Psalm 25, verse 6, we can see both uses of, these, of this word. It says, Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love. The, the Kehesed word means love kindness. A loving kindness from within. Because it is from the giver, not anything to do with the recipient and who they are or what they deserve. We read in, in Corinthians when Paul was talking about the love that we should have for one another as a church, as a family. Not for love for a spouse to, to a spouse or anything, but just love for individuals. He says, love is kind, love keeps no records of wrong, love is patient. That's what we're talking about. The person getting the love, getting the mercy, didn't necessarily do anything to deserve it. In fact, they may be your enemy and do everything to deserve the opposite. But we're still supposed to show mercy and love because God is merciful and loving and kind to us. The third word is kunan. It's to show favor or pity. So you get in the pity because we can't do anything on our own. We cannot make our way to God. Contrary to what other religions say, you will never make your way to God. That's why He had pity and mercy upon us. And He came to us in the form of a man to take on our suffering or our shames. We have a Savior that can, that can empathize with us. He understands everything that we went through because the pain and suffering that I have or you have doesn't compare to what He suffered doesn't compare to what He gave up to become the creation that He created in the first place. To humble Himself and die for our sins. So therefore I urge you or beg you, brothers and sisters, I plead with you because of God's mercies. This is what they understood from the Old Testament Scriptures. This is the mercy that, God is, that Paul is talking about here. Mercy which we did not deserve, mercy which we did nothing to obtain, but because God is merciful and kind, because He had pity on us, because He has loving kindness from His bowels as a mother would love a child. So the mercy used here is in Greek, of course, and it's oktermos, which means a mercy that we did not deserve. Think about it. What did you do? Sometimes we think of ourselves, and Paul goes on to say this, more haughty or more proud than we ought to. Oh, I do this and that right, so I understand why God loves me. He loves you regardless of what you do. And don't get proud and don't think that you're any better than anyone else. Because it was because of His mercy that He poured out His love on the cross and continues to bestow grace upon grace upon grace upon His children. That we can belong to God. Whoa! I belong to God. What a crazy concept. I am His child. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. So in view of God's mercy, <clears throat> I call you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Couldn't He say my time, or my talent, or my energy? But He said my body. Because it's a physical substance that was placed, a physical body that was placed upon an, offer, upon an altar as an offering to God. Paul is saying, I urge you, because of God's mercy, to offer your life, everything about you, your body, as a living sacrifice. Something that is going to be burnt up and used completely as an offering for God, but is living while we're doing it. It's not a one-time thing. It's a lifelong thing that we do that we deny ourselves daily, we take up our cross and we follow after Jesus. That we are a living example of the light of Christ. We are a living example of the love that God has for us when He would give His own Son to die for us, which is holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable, true, proper, and acceptable form of worship. It just makes sense. The word used here is logical. Paul has set up everything in Romans so far to, to give you this example of what all God has done, the pitiful, wretched state that you're in, that you could do nothing to obtain mercy and grace, so God did it for you. So here he's saying this is just logical and reasonable, that this is the way that you worship. 
So how do we do that? Verse 1 tells us what to do. Verse 2 kind of tells us how. First, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Because if you're conforming to the world, if you're doing the things that the world does, which what we read from, from Matthew is that even those who don't know Jesus lend to those expecting repayment. Even they'll give to people. But see, we've got to go beyond that to show the love of Christ, to give undeserving, unmerited love from the heart because God first loved us. So we need to show that kind of love. So don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed like a, a caterpillar to a butterfly. A total change. Everything about it. Nothing, you would never know that a butterfly came from a caterpillar. caterpillar. It is the root word metamorphosis. To be totally changed from what we are. And isn't a butterfly beautiful? And a caterpillar's kind of, ooh, yuck. That's what we came from. Ooh, yuck. Sin and shame to this beautiful creation in Christ. If we will not conform to this world, but be transformed instead by the renewing of our mind, that we repent, that we change our way of thinking so that our heart is changed so that we think differently, so that when we look at somebody, we don't say, ooh, we say, I feel compassion and love and mercy. I have because God gave to me. What can I do to help you? Let me tell you what can help the most of anything out there in the world. The most incredible form of mercy and love is that God gave His Son to die for you. We need to be that example. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good pleasing, and perfect will. So what is the most outlandish thing that you can think of as an example of love? It's easy. We quote it all the time. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, His one and only Son, that whosoever will believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Think about that. Because there's a lot of people out there hurting in this world, suffering, searching. And we have the answer. So we should have that joy that people know that we belong to God. That we're a light to the world. That we love. If you look in your bulletins, it says they'll know us by our doctrine. And it's marked out. No, they won't. They'll know us by our love. By the love that we give them. By the way we treat them. The kindness that we have. Especially when they don't deserve it all. Especially if, if they've been mean or nasty to us and yet we are loving and kind to them. They're like, what? This person's nuts. Yeah, we're crazy for Jesus, right? So there are two more Greek words that talk about mercy. And I can't really do this one. I'm going to try. Splognizama. You're supposed to say gesundheit, right? <laughs> It's closely related to the racham. It's that inward compassion from the bowels that we have. So again, we have that word in the New Testament. The good Samaritan had this kind of love. The, the man that was on the roadside deserved nothing to get his love, to get taken care of, and he took care of him, and he went way beyond what was necessary to take care of him. When the multitudes cried out to Jesus to heal them and stuff, and you find the word mercy, this is what you find here. Because Jesus was compassionate upon them, not because they deserved anything. He knew that they only wanted their ailments healed. That they wouldn't necessarily follow after Him, but He still had compassion upon them. And in the most common form is eleo. It's a love kindness again. That mercy that we show simply because we are God's children so therefore we're called to show mercy. It should be our nature. If we're going to be like Christ, how can we not be merciful and loving and kind to everyone? <clears throat> so how do we tie this together towards being rich to God? We studied that in Luke 12 where the, the rich man had an abundance which came from God, he decided to store it up in his barns. He said, here's what I'll do. I'll eat, drink, and I'll be merry. I'll have plenty tucked away. But he never, ever thought about why God blessed him with the things that he had. There was no dishonesty in what he had. We don't know how much effort he put into to, to raising those crops. But we do know, again, that if God didn't give us the sunshine and rain, we wouldn't have the crops. But God gives to us so that we can be kind and generous to others. And I've told you before that you're rich with God whether you realize it or not. You're rich in this world. 
Americans are rich in the eyes of the world. We have so much, so many things, and do we give God thanks for them? But Jesus offered what? Mercy to everyone. He didn't condemn them. And we take the example of the two thieves on the cross. The one had no part of Jesus. But the other recognized Jesus and said, Remember me. And Jesus did. He said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So when we think about justice, we think about, Oh, I've been this way or that way, but this person's been this way. I wish God would, would take care of them. Really? Is that really what you want? Or do you want the mercy and kindness that God bestowed on you to be bestowed on everyone? Think about that. The mercy and grace that He showed you, don't you want everyone to be able to have a part of that? Continuing on in Romans 12, verse 3, it says, For by, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, because see, here's what we tend to do. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. That's the first thing that's going to stop you from having the compassion and mercy, from being transformed, because you're conforming to the world here. They want the justice. No, you don't. You don't want God's justice. You want His mercy. So Paul says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather, we got two conjunctions there tying it together that mean the total opposite. Think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now don't take that wrong. That doesn't mean that God gave me this faith and gave you this faith. It's the standard of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to compare to. That's how we're supposed to live. Like Christ is what the word Christian means. To be like Christ or a little Christ. That's the standard that we have. And we have the power of God inside of us. Jesus promised that, that He didn't leave us as orphans, but He sent the Comforter to teach us, to empower us, to walk this walk. So that we have the example, we have the teachings of Christ, and we say, well, those are, those are tough teachings. I, I don't know how I can do them. Well, you can't. That's why you have to die to yourself. That's why you have to let the power of God take over. But the standard is Jesus Christ. That is the faith that has been distributed to each of us. For just... Verse 4, for just as each of us has one body with many members, now Paul is giving an example, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we too, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. So now we switch from the individual to the collective, to the body of Christ, to all these different members who are different. So how, do we, how in the world do we get along? Except by the power of God, by His Spirit that brings about unity. For we're many parts of one body. But I can tell you right now, when my heel is in pain, my whole body suffers. And we should be that way when one of our members is suffering. And when it feels good, my whole body's in joy. We should be celebrating. We should be lights to this world, telling others of Jesus Christ as one body. Even though we're different with different functions, we all serve the same Savior. So in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to the other. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to the function of the whole body again. If my heel is hurting, if it's cracked, I cannot, the rest of my body cannot function the way that it's supposed to. We have different gifts, verse 6, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously, which means sincerely, from a loving heart again. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, Eliejo, do it cheerfully, from a ready and a changed mind. Don't be envious of the other gifts that the people have. Don't think that they're any more important to the body than you are because one little bone can make the whole body suffer. I know. Maybe that's why I have this today, so I can prove that point. These are Paul's words to the church. So he's gone from one person. I urge you individually to realize that you were purchased. You were ransomed back from death. You were given mercy and grace to be a living sacrifice, not just for the world, but collectively as a body. 
to carry out because the church can do so much more than one person can do collectively. He said these words to the church at Philippi in Philippians 2 starting in verse 1. Therefore, we've got the therefore tying us together again. What has happened before is, is, is Paul is telling us again to live a, man, a life worthy, a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, so do you? Are you encouraged? If any comfort from His love, do you have any comfort? Knowing that you are going to spend eternity in heaven rather than eternity in hell. If any common sharing in the Spirit, because again, we're one body. If any tenderness and compassion, and the word used here is that splagnaco again, I just butchered it, but that from our bowels, if you feel it down in your womb, as a mother would, that love for one another, if you feel this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, that changing of your mind again, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus your standard again. How? Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for His own advantage. But rather He made Himself nothing, not just lower, but nothing. The God of all, the one who was there in the beginning, who will be there in the end, humbled Himself to be His creation. Nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, to serve. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's our standard. And that's what God did for us through Christ. That's how much He loves us. So we've got a clear standard on how we're supposed to treat everyone. So let's go back to Romans chapter 12 and keep reading. Starting verse 9, Love must be sincere. You can't fake it. It doesn't do you any good to do that. The New Living Testament says, New Living Translation says, don't just pretend to love others. So it puts it pretty accurately, doesn't it? Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor, honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So we see that we're supposed to give to each other in the church. What about the world, right? We don't see anything here yet. Okay, verse 14 switches. If you didn't get it, it switches from the church to the world. Because you shouldn't have these people in the church. Bless those who persecute you. So we're not talking about the church anymore. Hopefully. <laughs> right? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people in low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be, do not be overcome with, by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, Beth told me a year or two ago, she said she hates the word Christian, the term Christian. Not because of what it means, it means like Christ, but because of what it has as an implication to it in this world today because you know she lives overseas so when the word christian comes up very much is it associated with hypocrite now why is that except that we've done that to ourselves because all eyes are on us and we're supposed to follow after jesus we're supposed to live out the things that we just heard but how often do we when somebody slaps us on the cheek we don't turn the other cheek we raise up the fist right it's natural again. That's conforming to the world. 
That's why we have to die to ourselves. That's why we have to realize that we are God's children. That's why we have to realize what Jesus Christ did for us, the power that's residing inside of us, or we will conform to the world. But if we do something different, if we act differently, if we act out of love and kindness and mercy, then people will see Christ through us. It's not that hard to figure out. So people are watching you. They're looking at your actions. Actions speak louder than words, right? They're looking at your conduct to see if your faith is genuine. To see if you walk the walk rather than just talking the talk. And if you notice in here, vengeance is not for us. It's for God. And that can give you the best peace. Because then you don't have to worry about what this person does to you. They have to stand accountable for that. But guess what? I have to stand accountable for how I act towards that person. And I'm supposed to love them and not repay evil with evil. But realize that my God has that responsibility of the wrath. That He will and pray for them so that they don't have to experience that wrath. So that they can experience mercy just like I did because now I don't have to experience that wrath. Do you see it? But if you aren't loving and kind, they're not going to see Christ through you. And Paul is quoting in Proverbs here, words of Solomon, because he was wise. He said, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. You're going to burn them. Yeah, they're going to be burnt one way or the other because your actions spoke love. And they don't understand that and they, they, can't, they can't fathom that. So it's going to eat at them and eat them. Why did they love me instead of repaying me with evil? What, what's up here? And if they don't respond to Jesus Christ as a part of that, then you're leaving the coal to burn them eternally because that's God's wrath. Because see, the coal is a sign of burning up. But we want to be our loving kindness so that we heap coals on them, bringing them to repentance. That's why Jesus said, Woe to the Pharisees. He told them what they, was do what they were doing is wrong, but He continually told them to repent and change. He never took away His offer of love and mercy. Proverbs 25, 21 and 22 says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. There's that promise. Paul didn't quote that, but that's what um, Solomon said. He said, The Lord will reward you. You're being rich towards God by doing that. You're building up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. Love must be sincere. We can't pretend at it. We're to hate what is evil. I'm going back to Romans 12. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. That's our call as individuals and as a church. Can you do that? It's tough. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible, right? It's still our standard. Jesus set our standard. Closing out Romans 12, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people in low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I've read it twice. I could keep on reading it because we need to hear that. We don't get it through our thick heads, do we? But because of mercy, because of God's love, because of His attributes, 
We who believe in Jesus Christ are God's children. We belong to God. We are free from wrath. We know that when we die, we don't have anything to fear in death. And it's our responsibility to tell the world. That's why Jesus prayed. He said, I don't pray that you take them out of this world, Father. But He prayed that we will have the strength that we need to stand firm, to love one another. So are you rich towards God? In Luke 6, verse 17, He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of His disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear and to be healed of their diseases. Now, did you notice something there? There are two groups of people and two desires. One is the true disciples, the other, and they came to hear. Um, and then there are, well, I told you that, sorry. There's the true disciples and there's the crowd. One came to hear, one came simply to get what they could get. Now, which one's a true disciple, right? They came to hear and to be obedient to the Word, Right? Because if they only came to get what they could get, they're not really a true disciple, are they? They're just a crowd. Where do you stand? <clears throat> Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. God gave mercy on all of them. He didn't just do it for the disciples. And the people all tried to touch Him because power was coming from Him and healing them all. He pours out mercy on everyone. It's just a matter of whether we accept Jesus in faith or not. Verse 20, looking at His disciples, He said, now here's where it changes to those who came to hear and be obedient. Blessed are you who are poor. And He's not talking about physical. He's talking about not being rich towards this world, but being rich towards God. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Are you seeing a pattern about how to be rich towards God? Are you seeing a pattern how to build up treasures in heaven rather than on this earth? It means you don't worry about the things on this earth, but instead you're rich to God with what you have and He has blessed you so much. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Woe, you have a chance to change. These are Jesus' words saying, listen to me. This is to His disciples again. This is not to the world. So that means that even as disciples, we struggle with this world. That we have to die and become a living sacrifice. So in verse 27, But to you who are listening, He's already pointed and said to His disciples, but now He's picking out of the disciples, Are you listening? Who's listening to my words? Who's going to follow after me? Because this is tough teaching. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, that's stealing from you, right? Or whatever it is. Do not demand it back. It's getting tougher. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. This is why we need to be different, why we need to be like Christ. And if you do good to those who, who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who ex you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Ouch! Right? Because when I do those things, I kind of think of myself more highly than I ought to. But Jesus' words are sobering here. Three times He said, these things that you think are admirable, listen up. Even sinners do that. You're going to have to step it up a notch. You're going to have to be empowered by the Spirit to live a life following after Me. So I say, but, here's another but. 
Love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And two things. You will be children of the Most High. Hmm. Those are some good promises, aren't they? Why? Because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. That's why we're to be called to be merciful and loving. Because God first loved us. We wouldn't even know how to love if it wasn't for the fact that God first loved us. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Jesus stops here, right? No. <laughs> Do not judge. Yep. I'm guilty of that. And you will be, not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. He'll just pour out some good on you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So how can a Christian not love? It should bring you to repentance. If you're listening, he's talking to the disciples, and then he says to you who are listening, do you love? Because God has given to you. You need to be rich with what you have. Even if you don't have much in this world material, you are rich with the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And He has called you to be rich in giving out that love. It's not about material things. Yes, we're called to give to the poor and stuff, but it's about giving that love to one another. Truly loving them. So that we're not only rich to go towards God, we're not only His children, but we're drawing others that they see a difference, that they see Christ in us. So how did you stand up to that? I know it makes me think a little bit. You're also going to be given some opportunities to give. I talked to Beth a little bit last week and she said she thanks us so much for all that we give her. She is overwhelmed and she could still use more. I didn't put but. She could still use more. I remember when she told us before that she could use a little bit more. She said, you know, I'd like to have some clean underwear. That's not asking much. She wanted some new underwear because they had holes in them. She's doing fine. She thanks us so much. But there's more room we can give. We can give to um, her foundation as well. Next week you're going to get to meet um, the Roberts. And we can give to them as missionaries as well. And there's a world out there that needs Jesus' love. They need to know we're Christians by our love, not by our doctrine. By the way that we love one another, the joy that we have. And us as a body need to share with each other in joy and share with each other in heartache. We're there. We have different gifts. We saw that from Scripture that we can use to support one another. When I'm hurting and down, you can support me. When you're hurting and down, I can support you. When we're all celebrating, we can celebrate. And most of all, we can tell each other that, you know why that you see this unity? You know why that you see this love? Because God so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but instead have everlasting life. Father, we thank You so much for Your love. We thank You for Jesus' words, for His examples. And not that He set something out there that, that we couldn't obtain, but that He gave us the power of God inside of us so that we don't have to sin anymore. Sin has been defeated upon the cross. And we long for the day when Jesus returns and that we spend forever with You. We thank You for loving us. We thank You for adopting us as Your children. Help us to just realize how much love the Father has for His children. The privilege that we have to be called children of God. Thank You for the Spirit that You've given us that empowers us with gifts. Thank You for the body of Christ. Thank You for the freedom that we have, especially in this country, to worship You. We just praise You. We thank You for the love that You have given us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.